You're listening to Let's Talk Macro. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Let's Talk Macro, the podcast on macroeconomics by IDFC Mutual Fund, where we bring you interesting, important and uh, topical macroeconomic conversations, both global and domestic. This includes, you know, relevant economic events, data concepts and the inferences and implications that all of these dialogues have on us or these major events have on us. I'm Mahalia on today's podcast. So joining us right now is Srijit Balasubramanian, economist in the fixed income fund management team at IDFC Mutual Fund. He has an experience of close to 13 years in macroeconomic research and handles all the in-house domestic and uh, global economic research for us as well. And uh, you've uh, probably heard his voice on Let's Talk Macro in the past few episodes. Now, on today's podcast, uh, we're going to be discussing how monetary policy response in the U.S. to the COVID pandemic deferred from that to the 2008 global financial crisis crisis or the GFC as we're going to refer to it through this conversation. We're going to look at the various measures taken by the Fed in response to the two crises, the difference in economic and monetary policy contexts, and how policy normalization has also been different. Some very interesting themes. Welcome to the show, Srijith. How are you doing? Hi, thank you. It's good to be on the third episode of Let's Talk Macro. Yes, absolutely. And a very interesting conversation today, Srijit. Uh, I think why don't we start, yes. you know, by understanding the context, really, some two very different events, but with uh, similar outcomes, right, uh, on our economy. So central banks were actually quick to respond to the pandemic in early 2020 when it hit and uh, continued with their support for quite a while as well. Now, if you look at the US, right, what was the primary difference between the Fed's response to the pandemic and to to the GFC, very open-ended question, but take it away for us. Uh, so the Fed's primary tool is the Fed's, you know, the Fed funds target rate. So it's policy rate, which the, you know, the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC decides. So if you remember, the FOMC had actually cut its policy rate by around you know, 150 basis points in March 2020, uh, you know, when the uh, pandemic started. But more importantly, we have to actually look at the policy stance and the level of rates before the two crises. It sort of you know reflect the economic context going into each of these two crises. Now, 2002 to 2003, which is before the GFC, globally, we had a very strong trade and economic growth uh, period. And even the US is experiencing some inflationary pressures back then. So from 2004 to 2006, the Fed had actually raised rates by you know over 400 basis points, I think 425 basis points to be exact, and it held it there till end of uh, August 2007. So when the GFC hit, it could actually cut mm-hmm. rates in response to the crisis uh, by a very steep you know 500 basis points in you know, over a year. So if you compare that to the eve of the pandemic, where mm-hmm. policy rates were only 150 basis points above zero, so there's this big uh, difference in gap. Right. So this was because after GFC, the Fed continued to hold rates low for several years and you know, it started normalizing or actually raising rates only from end 2015. So that is like a good seven years after the GFC hit. Even then, it had actually cut rates in uh, 2019 as the economy was, you know, benefiting from an extended expansion without any real inflationary concerns. So the space available to cut was quite different in each of these two crises. But so was the economic context in terms of, you know, in the inflation and labor markets. Hmm. That's really interesting. Thank you for um, opening up the conversation with that insight. I also want to draw everyone's attention to a really interesting phenomenon, right? Quantitative easing or the QE. We've heard a lot about that and how the Fed undertook uh, that for many years after the GFC, right? Was that also different this time in terms of their response? And where exactly are we with this whole QE thing? So uh, QE is nothing but you know the purchase of securities, typically longer term government bonds or even you know mortgage backed securities or MBS of government sponsored entities in case of US, uh, which is to increase money supply in the economy or in other words, you know, increase the reserve that banks hold at the Fed. Now this obviously also increases the central bank's balance sheet size. Now after the GFC, we had multiple rounds of QE across years, you know, as the Euro area also witnessed economic turmoil, if you remember. Now, mm-hmm. the so-called taper tantrum episode when the Fed said it could actually just consider tapering its asset purchases. That is, you know, still buy assets, but by a lesser amount. And some of the emerging markets, including India, witnessed capital outflows in. This was only in September 2013, if you remember. So, which is like, and again, you know, five years after the DSE hit. So, QE was actually quite spread out with the initial response being in, you know, late 2008. But then across to, uh, 2009 to 2013, this continued. Contrary to that, QE just after the onset of the pandemic was much heavier and quicker. So during uh, February to May 2020, which is you know, during the initial phase of the pandemic, the Fed's balance sheet size actually increased by close to $3 trillion. 
which actually compares to just 1.3 trillion dollars in late 2008 so that's almost like you know close to three times mm. so even if you look at it you know in terms of percentage of gdp or you know whatever it is to adjust for the size of the economy qe still you know is much heavier and was much heavier and quicker in 2020 that is so and even after that the fed continued to increase its balance sheet size uh, right. till mid- 2022 uh 2022 yeah last year before it actually started tapering its asset purchases so it's not actually much below the the peak balance sheet size yet so in fact mm. if you look at the size of the fed's balance sheet alongside you know that of the the european central bank the ecb or the bank of japan the boj or even the rbi for that matter if you look at it you know if you sort of start just before the pandemic and then you see the trajectory thereafter you can actually clearly see how big the spike is for the fed in terms of the balance sheet size versus you know the other countries and it's continuation at a higher level you know although admittedly some part of it is due to you know the uh, strength of the dollar mm-hmm. and therefore you'll have currency depreciation for other countries and their balance sheet sizes would look a little smaller uh, but then despite that fact you can actually appreciate the fact that you know the fed's balance sheet expansion has been much larger so in fact if you look at the rbi's balance sheet it actually peaked in october 2021 which is you know right. late last year mm-hmm. the year before that in fact uh, as it started deploying its fx reserves so this is the difference and on where we stand today in terms of balance sheet size uh, but another thing that we also need to pay attention to is the composition of the change in balance sheet so you know uh, you know for example if you look at the asset side of the fed's balance sheet back in gfc you know you had a lot of purchases of mortgage backed securities like we just mentioned mm-hmm. so that was much higher because that is the nature of the crisis then because the crisis was then linked to the housing sector and what we had now was a pandemic so the share of uh, the mbs purchases was much lower similarly the fed started using the reverse repo facility from 2014 only uh, when we were actually sell securities with an agreement to repurchase and pay interest to counterparties so but that happened only from 2014 so you wouldn't see that as a major part on the liabilities uh, you know and during the gfc but that's a much bigger number now so the liabilities side would look very different for that instance so these are some of the examples you know uh, and the impact of what the qe uh, that you can see on the fed's balance sheet actually Hmm. Okay. All right. And uh, good that you bring up the RBI actually, because I did want to pivot the conversation towards uh, looking at comparing at least two different contexts. You know, we saw that the RBI introduced okay. several other measures, right, during the pandemic, apart from yeah. uh, interest rate changes and asset purchases. And I don't know if I'm right in assuming this, but I'm sure the Fed might have done something similar too. You know, yeah. what what were those measures that they sort of introduced, and um, were they very different from the facilities that they rolled out in response to the? GFC Yeah so you're right so various facilities were rolled out by the Fed in 2020 and some of them were in fact new uh, but before that actually if you uh, look at it it established some standard of the shelf facilities like you know like FX swap lines with central banks reduction in the primary credit rate which is the rate at which Fed lends to generally sound uh, deposit institutions and this is also linked to the Fed funds rate so these were used during GFC also but apart from thing uh, these two actually two things the Fed did in 2020 Uh, where one it established a temporary foreign international monetary authorities repo facility for you know uh, foreign central banks and it also temporarily changed the supplementary leverage ratio to which is nothing but to reduce the tier one capital that banks are required to maintain uh, for about a year but uh, apart from these measures there were actually nine special facilities initiated by the fed in response to covid and actually uh, out of this five were new and not there during the years so just to give an example uh, one of the five new facilities was a a paycheck protection program liquidity facility so which is in place actually you know from april 2020 and it is there for more than a year this program if you look at it so there was a paycheck protection program ppp by the small business administration in the us which actually provided loans to small businesses so that they can keep their workers on payroll uh, during the pandemic the feds facility in turn supplied liquidity to participating financial institutions through term financing backed by these ppp loans to small businesses this is one one sort of a facility the another example that i can give you is the main street lending program which actually supported lending to eligible small and medium sized businesses with deferral of principal and interest payments now even uh, the facilities that were not new uh, you know apart from these five were actually quite effective so some of these were actually there like i said during gfc also for example right. the, uh, the money market mutual fund liquidity facility which okay. you know assisted money market funds in meeting demands for redemptions by households and investors and even something like the primary dealer credit facility which allowed primary dealers to support smooth market functioning right and just to ensure the availability of credit 
So all these uh, credit facilities which actually kicked in uh, now were very timely, and some of them were well utilized also, and uh, that really helped. But also you have to look at you know uh, what other measures apart from the credit facilities, particularly in 2008 were, because the nature of the crisis was quite different. Now in GFC we had a financial crisis which actually originated from the housing sector. Mm-hmm. So the Fed had to authorize an acquisition of financial institutions. uh you know and even lending to some by regional feds right uh, it had something called an operation twist which is you know quite famous in uh, this is actually done in 2011 mm-hmm. where it actually bought long term treasury securities and simultaneously you know sold short term ones as mm-hmm. like i said before the things are also complicated by the euro crisis after gfc so in fact post gfc period saw the rise of uh, forward guidance as a major tool which is uh, a big thing even now so i mean in short all the facilities and measures of fed rolled out in response to the pandemic Uh, some of them are definitely new, uh, but man, all of them are quite important. Nice. Okay. Um, also, great that you sort of bring up the difference, right, between context of the GFC and how it's rooted in the housing sector and the pandemic. I think that's important for us to remember because you know when we look at the pandemic being this major economic event, it was followed by many other economic events as we've seen over the past two years, right? One of the biggest things is the rising uh, inflation all over the world that people are experiencing, and we're currently in the phase where many central banks around the world are withdrawing their policy accommodations right that they actually provided during the pandemic and going beyond that like the fed for example is doing now uh, to fight very high inflation withdrawal of monetary policy support is equally as important as providing it it would seem how different uh, is that at this time you see right so normalization is a very important aspect and again different this time given the different context uh, after gsc we had a slow exit phase where initially uh, liquidity and credit facilities were allowed to expire and then forward guidance was tweak asset purchases tapered only from early 2014 policy rates were hiked only from december 2015 and uh, fed's balance sheet normalization in fact started only in 2017 and even that was sort of reversed and rates were you know like i said before cut again in 2019 so it took a really long time uh, and it was like i said a very slow exit as inflation was actually undershooting the fed's 2 percentage target and then around 2019 if you remember uh, the economy was clearly benefiting from an extended expansion so uh, in the us unemployment rate was low not just at the headline level but even across you no know, lower income groups and for you know various ethnic groups the fed in fact updated its monetary policy strategy and adopted the uh, average inflation targeting framework which is you know you know where it actually decided that it will allow inflation to overshoot its target for a while so that uh, the 2% target is achieved on average over time so it's not like you know it will immediately uh, high rates when the inflation goes above 2% it will let it be there for a while so that it averages 2% over a you know a period of time in fact they also made assessment uh, of economy's maximum employment more broad based and not just based on a single number so all this effectively like i said meant the fed would actually tolerate inflation even if it is a little above 2% and you know, not raise policy rates immediately when it sees inflation go beyond that but then obviously covid happened and uh, more importantly the outsized fiscal response that we saw uh, in the us to covid so what happened during covid to said we had an unprecedented situation of global supply bottlenecks but also very large direct fiscal stimulus in the us you know unlike in india for example where the stimulus was much more nuanced and the la- and, and a large part of uh, this direct uh, cash payments uh, you know and unemployment insurance really pushed up the uh, excess savings pool of households so this actually you know pushed good goods inflation much higher which is what you see rotating now into services and rents and the demand supply balance in the labor market was completely off uh, job openings spiked and wage growth picked up beyond their normal uh, rates so hence uh, you know uh, the fed after initially thinking the high inflation episode would be transitory it actually changed its narrative in 2021 the late 2021 uh, around the, uh, november and started raising rates and tapering the asset purchases from 2022 last year that is So so far, if you see the Fed has raised policy rates by 425 basis points, it plans to raise it further this year and potentially keep it at that peak rate. You know, even if growth slows down, until they actually see signs of sustained decline in inflation. But again, if you see recently, the headline inflation prints have started to come off, but core inflation has been stickier, and you know we have to look at wage growth, which continues to sort of stay high as well. Mm-hmm. So this time, it's not just a withdrawal of accommodation, but further tightening. Uh, you know, and that too much faster when many other central banks are also doing the same. So if you actually compare it to the GFC, uh, you know, in terms of normalization, uh, so mm-hmm. we we are hiking much more. It's been faster. The magnitude is also higher. So the tools are quite similar, but the way the Fed has used it is also different because the response to the crisis, particularly fiscal, uh, was much different this time.
All right. I think uh, this gives us a pretty good picture of how contextual uh, macroeconomics is as well and how important it is to consider context throughout all of these dialogues. And from today's conversation, I think it's clear that, you know, the monetary policy response in the US to the pandemic, uh, whether it was in the case of rate cuts or QE or rolling out um, credit facilities, were all different from that during the GFC. Um, and so is policy normalization and fight against high inflation. Um, but it's working hopefully <laughs> for us all really hope uh, everyone that this podcast helped you understand the impact of the monetary policy measures taken in the US what the fed is doing what it's doing now and what it holds for the near future as well uh, that's all from shrijit and i on today's uh, edition of let's talk macro i'm sure we'll be back with another interesting conversation on the series uh, in the meantime stay caught up with all that's happening around us and uh, yeah stay safe Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.